welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. I'm your host, Elizabeth Lund. Today my guest is Carla Schwartz, a poet, blogger, and filmmaker who spends her summers living on a solar-powered houseboat, or, to be more accurate, a 16-foot by 8-foot tiny house that has been attached to a pontoon boat and is propelled by a small electric outboard motor. Her experiences on that boat, which moves at the pace of a slow walk, inspired many of the poems in her new book, Intimacy with the Wind. Carla's experience is also distinctive because she earned a PhD in electrical engineering and worked for several years as an academic and then as a software technical writer. In 2014, she decided to focus on poetry and creating instructional videos on subjects such as how to unfold a Brompton bicycle, inflate a stand-up paddleboard, or build and move a tiny house. Her YouTube videos have had more than 1.6 million views. Carla has published two books of poems, and her work has appeared in a variety of journals, including Cactus Heart, Mom Egg, Switched on Gutenberg, and Solstice, among others. Her recent honors include the selection of her poem, Gum Surgery, for the 2017 Mayor of Boston's Poetry Program for display at Boston City Hall. The poem is also anthologized in City of Notions, a Boston poetry anthology edited by Danielle Legros george the city's poet laureate. In 2015, Carla's poem, In Defense of Peaches, was a Massachusetts Poetry Foundation poem of the moment. Carla brings great energy to all of her endeavors. I am pleased to have her here today to talk about poetry, math, and the impact of wind on her houseboat and her work. Wow, thank you, Elizabeth. Welcome. I was so intrigued by your book because I've always loved being on the water mm -hmm. and I'm fascinated with the tiny house trend. Oh wow, great. Normally I would ask you to read a poem from the book, but you actually have a video that you've created featuring the title poem. Yes, I do. So we will watch that now. Great. Intimacy with the wind. Speaking of the infinite, the parade of yachts, not a parade, the armada should have been a clue. While in golden oblivion, anchored in the lee at the lip of a bay, we ate our sandwiches until a plate slid off the table and we looked out the window at the blackening sky. The willy -waw that rushed in with the distant storm Horror on our faces, horror in the water, thrashed the boat wildly. Shoes, chairs, waves swept anything not tied down off the deck, and we wondered if we would tip. The pummeling rain made for shelter every time we opened the door. Then the realization we were adrift, the wind that threatened to crash us into a cliff, almost broke us up until the moment we engaged the motor and found out who we were. I love that video because it really allows you to feel like you're on the boat and it gives you a sense of what you were thinking when you were writing the poem. Certain lines are just lovely and haunting, especially these. Then the realization we were adrift. The wind that threatened to crash us into a cliff almost broke us up until the moment we engaged the motor and found out who we were. Yeah. That's lovely. Thank you, Elizabeth. Those lines especially make me think of two words, vulnerability and stability. Because when you're on the water, depending upon which lake you're on, conditions can change in a matter of minutes. And you always want stability on the boat. Do those words resonate for you? Yes, they do, uh, both in terms of the experiences that we had on the boat 
and uh, yeah, sometimes we, especially the experience of this that inspired this poem, it, it was a very vulnerable situation for us, you know. Um, stability, the boat is actually very stable, even though sometimes, like in this situation where it started to rock like that, uh, it didn't feel like it was stable, but it normally it, it, it's, it's a tri-tune boat, there are three pontoons, it's very solid. Um, but yes, it resonates for me both in terms of this poem and then other poems that I write, not necessarily even about living on the houseboat. Mm. Wind runs throughout this collection. And when we were talking earlier, you mentioned that there is a tremendous amount of wind on Lake Champlain. Yes. And that you were only able to go one direction because the wind was so strong. It prevailed from the south. So um, it, sometimes the winds would, would lighten up a little bit, but mm -hmm. they often prevailed from the south at a rate of 20 to 25 miles an hour. And our little boat could go not that fast. So we could never counter a wind like that, mm -hmm. you know, and, or if we did, we'd run out of motor, you know, run out mm -hmm. of battery, so. There are other poems in the book that deal with relationships and loss and various aspects of life. And again, wind comes into play with those experiences as well. Talk yes. a little bit about that. Ah, I have to think about which poems now. Do you have a poem in mind or? The poems about your mother, especially. Right. Um, well, there is this poem, Moving Slips, right? And that's a poem that was actually inspired by a friend of mine whose first language wasn't English. And I keep this blog. The blog is wakewiththesun.blogspot.com. And I said to, in my blog, I said, I'm going to move slips tomorrow and she didn't know what that meant. And so that, I thought, oh, well, this is interesting because there's a lot of meanings of moving slips. And so then I wrote this poem, which is inspired by the death of somebody and also um, the idea that you have to have courage to be able to um, change and move this boat from one slip to another when there is wind and wind can overtake you. And so mm -hmm. um, that I did bring that into the poem. And that idea of needing courage. Yes, yes. Is so important in so many of these poems and in daily life. Yes. Because so often people feel like they are dealing with vulnerability and stability and they may feel that, oh, I need more stability because there are too many winds in life. Exactly, exactly. Um. Viewers are probably wondering, why a tiny house instead of a more traditional boat? So this was Claude's idea. Claude is my partner. And uh, um, he wanted to be able to have a vacation home that was his own, that uh, he thought about, you know, instead of having to rent a house where you might have mildew or something like that. So he thought, okay, let's have a vacation home that is, you know, pristine and exactly the way we would want it. And so, uh, and the t he saw the, you know, this book on the tiny house movement and he thought, oh, that looks interesting. And then the, at the same time, this house was built in 2000, started to be built in 2011. It was completed uh, in, in uh, 2012, really, the first summer that it became a boat was 2013. And so um, then the idea that, oh, the solar technology is such that with the battery technology that you could actually make this into a tiny house that gets craned onto a pontoon boat and you can get the flotation and, and then, you then you can move around so you don't have to be fixed in one place. And, so it all kind of gelled, congealed, and uh, became uh, a great dream that became something beautiful. And the name of the boat is Wake with the Sun, and it really, it is something beautiful to behold. And that, actually, a picture of the boat is right here on the cover of my most recent collection of poetry. 
we talked earlier and you were saying how you have to avoid the shallows when you're in the boat and you prefer to be out in the deep. How did that experience challenge you or change you? Well, we became very good, a very good team. We actually became, you know, partners on the boat. And the, so the boat is something that really uh, brought, brings us together every time we go back onto it. And the idea that we drag this thing around from on a dock, we know how to dock this boat. The, the thing is very big and unwieldy. It doesn't uh, manipulate the way a normal boat was. It's not a monohull, it's a pontoon boat. So, and it doesn't, we don't have a strong motor. So when there's a wind, it could just blow us into a dock or, you know, so we have, we have to always be thinking about what's going to happen with the wind, what's going to happen. And, and we work really well together to figure out, okay, you get off, you pull, you, you turn the back of the boat this way, you know, we, and we just, we, we did it that way. And it was really wonderful in some ways to, you know, grow like that. I know I'm not directly answering your question, uh, and not because I'm trying to avoid it. It's just that I, I was just thinking about the idea of being in the shallows and how we need to avoid it. And so sometimes it'll be that I'll be on the lookout, you know, to make sure that we're not going to um, hit a rock. Um, and then when we go out into the deep water, we get to see a lot of beauty, and it's usually. Um, you know, the lakes that we've been on haven't had a huge amount of boat traffic so that you feel like you are not in danger. It's not like being on a highway, you know, so you're not in danger of being hit by other boats, you know, and, uh, and uh, you kind of can just relax and put the anchor down maybe in 20 feet of water and um, have a nice meal and look at the sunset. Mm. So. Oh, that sounds lovely. Yeah, it is very lovely. The idea of knowing when to stay in the shallows and when to go out in the deep is a bit like the creative process because when you begin a poem, you may start in the shallows, but at some point you have to go into the deeper waters because that's where the discovery is. Indeed, indeed. That's a lovely analogy, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, yeah, if you stay shallow, um, it might be interesting to some people, but maybe you're not going to sort of hit the mark when it comes to being a poet. Mm -hmm. The poems in the book blend beautifully, and it's almost like in some ways you put together a piece, pieces of the puzzle. Oh, wow, thank you. Thank you, that's, that's wonderful to hear. That makes me think of your background in math and electrical engineering because putting together a puzzle or figuring out a problem is so integral to that kind of work. How did you go from that kind of background to wanting to, to focus your life on poetry? Well, I actually started out as a poet. Uh, when I was eight years old, I used to write poems uh, in uh, elementary school, I was given permission actually by my teacher to pace the radiators while other kids were working on problems, uh, solving other problems. And I, I wrote a whole little book of rhyming poems when I was eight years old. And so that, that's how I started out. And then I ended up going, um, studying uh, an introductory engineering course before I went to college in high school. I came to Boston and I thought, oh, this is a creative application of math and science and I like math, I like science, I like to be creative. I'm going to apply to engineering school and that's what I did. And then I went to engineering school and I came up with a definition of an engineering degree, which is just the ability to use your tools at hand. and. Mm -hmm. In some ways, I guess I'm a, I'm a slightly an engineer when it comes to writing poetry in terms of 
having some tools that I rely on to solve poetic problems. Um, but that transition wasn't, um, I didn't feel like it was so difficult since poetry was with me my whole life. So it has mm -hmm. been. I love that idea of engineering gives you the ability to use tools to solve problems and that poetry does the same thing. What are some of your favorite tools as a writer? As a writer, ah, oh, that's a great question. Um, rhythm is part of it, I think, and the sound of words. I think those come naturally to me to include words that sound well together in a poem and um, somehow have a little rhythm that allows you to hear that sound um, when you're hearing it read aloud. Um, I th yeah, I would say those are my favorite tools. Mm -hmm. And when you're writing, is the process addition, subtraction? Is it discovery or all of the above? It is all of the above. I uh, often think of something I want to write about, and it might be based on something I've observed. Uh, and then I add, uh, obviously, to the poem as I'm writing it. Uh, but then I often subtract uh, things that don't seem to work and sometimes add other things. And, and I will listen to it as I'm reading it and, make re and do revision. I'll read it out loud and revise. Mm -hmm. So going back to the boat, what was your day like there? Each day in some ways was different, in some ways the same. And every day I'd wake up and I would often get on my paddleboard and paddle out for about a mile, then a, wherever I was. And I, I, I had actually also, speaking of the wind, I would use the wind to decide which direction I was going to go because I particularly don't particularly like swimming into the wind so I don't mind paddling into the wind so I would paddle into the wind so that I could swim back with the wind <laughs> that was my that was you know one of my uh, how I made the decision on where I was going to go and I would drag my paddleboard around with me from the swim back just uh, so that I'd be visible to other boats and uh, Often I listen to music while I'm swimming too, so I kind of have this musical time. And that was really nice. And then we'd have breakfast. And um, I would make usually the breakfast and it, often eggs sunny side up, which we called eggs solar side up since we have our solar powered houseboat. And um, with we like spices and so it's um, a fun and beautiful breakfast. And if you go to my blog, You'll see some pictures, if you look over the summer, some pictures of the breakfast that I made, which are very colorful with these yellow yolks and lots of fruit and, and lettuce and uh, the eggs. Is there a correlation between poetry and making videos? <laughs> um, I don't know, except that the only thing is, you know, the poetry in some ways, poetry and photography are very close, I believe, in terms of the way that, you know, you will take something you observe and, and pinpoint, bring it to a pinpoint of this snap of the moment. Uh, and you can do that with words in a poem and you can do that with a photograph. And uh, a video is one step outside, you know, further than photography, on the one hand, on the other hand, when you are writing a script or thinking of a script for a video, you basically want it to be as simple as possible, as concise as possible, just like you're writing a piece of journalism. You want it, to, you know, to be something that you can communicate without extra words, without extra anything, so that uh, you don't lose your audience mm -hmm. and you, you hook them in and, uh, and they are there with you the whole way. 
When you think about the other poems in the book, some of them deal with invasive species. How do they fit in with the whole idea of intimacy with the wind? That's a great question. I, um, I don't know that they fit specifically in with, with um, the, the, the other poems uh, that are based, uh, inspired by the solar-powered houseboat, although I, I've been learning, or had been learning, especially that summer, a lot about invasive plant species with New England, and so they're always with me, and I'm noticing them as I'm traveling. And so, so in, they, they do influence my work, you know. And um, some of these, uh, I did a short video on, and I mentioned in my Obade to Champlain, uh, the algae that uh, is not necessarily, in, it is invasive, but it's not necessarily uh, non-native, uh, that uh, affects Lake Champlain. Um, it's a very serious problem in Lake Champlain right now, uh, uh, where uh, the runoff from the farmland has um, made a huge amount of nitrogen in the in the uh, lake. And toward the end of the summer, it gets to be pea soup certain places, and it's really, really awful, you know. So I had that uh, uh, speaking to me when I wrote Obad to Champlain. The fact that your book has all of those different aspects makes perfect sense to me because poetry can celebrate and challenge reality at the same time. And the mix of poems in your book does exactly that. There are moments where you're out on the water, it's wonderful, and then there's the darker reality of these invasive species. But poetry has room for all of that. Thank you. Yes, yes, it does. It does. And, um, and I felt like um, I could use these invasives and somehow bring back things like memories and cooking. And cooking is something that I do a lot. I do it on the boat. And when you were asking about my everyday life on the boat, a lot of it had to do with cooking too, feeding and cooking and nourishing. And, um, and so invasives tie into that a lot because I think about food and one of my poems is about the fact that the roots of the garlic mustard are, are actually edible at a certain point. And, um, and, and, and so I talk about cooking up the garlic mustard. In fact, I think I tie that into uh, the Ballad of the Sad Cafe, actually. There's a little tie into that book. And so that's kind of fun. The idea of nurturing and getting rid of the invasives makes perfect sense with poetry. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That is true. That is true. We definitely want to um, keep it clean <laughs> and grow it from home. <laughs> we are almost out of time, so okay. I have a quick question for you, and then I will ask you to close with another poem. Okay. You've done a lot of readings recently yes. from this book. What excites listeners the most about it? I think my delivery, actually. They, they seem to respond to it because I take my time when I read a poem and they respond to that. But I also, I think it's the idea that, um, you know, this is, comes from a solar powered houseboat. People are pretty excited about that. And, and we were nomads. You know, we could live entirely off the grid with no fossil fuels, you know, and that is what was speaking to these poems. I love that. What a great description. Thank you. So would you read one more poem for I us? I will. I will. I'll read you the first poem in the book, which is one of my favorite, although I have many. And this is called Photoshopping the Body. Surely my mother would have known what to do, would have understood masking, healing. Once she used Illustrator to make a rainbow medusa of my sister's hair. That was back in the 90s when nothing was obvious. She was just that kind of woman. 
to dive into a computer program and wrangle with it until she got what she wanted. For this image of me in my bikini, she would have been a magic wand wizard, smoothing out the wrinkles and shadows, removing the thickness around the thighs, that same belly, those same thick thighs she bore with a click plus drag of a mouse, wouldn't she? To look in the mirror and see my mother's rounded body, the sunburst of skin from the navel, the rays, the folds, the darker vertical depression that leads netherward, what I was once embarrassed of for her, saddens me. My mother never wore a bikini, but would have relished summers on this lake to swim every morning after waking just a few steps from shore. My mother, if only she were here, would sit with me overlooking the lake, wearing shorts and oversized tee, an iPad in hand, never mind her belly, and swipe, tap, hold. Thank you so much. Thank your you. Poems and your insights. Thank you, Elizabeth. This has been wonderful. Do you find yourself feeling down in winter? Or if you experience depression through the year, does it get worse in the colder and darker months? I'm here to tell you about winter depression and what you can do that may be helpful. Seasonal affective disorder or SAD is a type of depression that tends to occur in the fall. You may lose your energy and motivation. You may feel sluggish, agitated, distracted, hopeless, and you may have problems with sleeping, your appetite, or suicidal thoughts. SAD can lead to social withdrawal, problems with school or work, and substance abuse. Here's the good news. You can talk with your primary care physician, your psychiatrist, or mental health professional. There are effective treatments such as counseling, light box therapy, or medication. Sometimes we feel bad in the fall and winter anyway, especially during the holidays. But if a mood slump continues for days or weeks, don't wait. Talk with your doctor or counselor for more information and support.